um, XPORC or whatever. I don't remember exactly the the way you write it, X P O R C or something. Uh, yeah. Ah, this one. This, yeah, exactly. Thank you very much. It's on screen. Thank you, Norm. Thank you very much. Am I amplified? I am not amplified. Am I amplified now? Well, it's been fun. I'll see you all later. <laughs> okay. Try again. Testing, testing. Hello, hello. Testing, testing. Is it unmuted? No, it's not unmuted. Look at my tie. Yes, can you? Is that better? Okay, I will speak down and I will speak slowly and it will all be okay. And what about trying the another one? And I'll try a different microphone. Right, so and then we will try to switch it on and off. Try to say something now. Try to say something now. Is that better? Somebody in the back wave at me. Thank you very much. All right, fabulous. Thank you. I, uh, I'm going to talk about XPROC this afternoon briefly, and uh, I'm going to do, uh, I, I, sorry, this is slightly weird. Um, I titled this talk Ready or Not because when I, is that legible or does that need to be bigger? We're all happy? Okay. When, uh, when, I, when, I decide, when I pitched the talk, I thought if it gets accepted, then February the 15th or the 14th or whatever it is, will eventually roll around and I will have to stand up here, so I better be ready or not, right? So um, I'm happy to say that uh, I am ready, I was born ready, um, the XML, bring it. Uh, the next question to ask then is, are the specifications ready? Uh, and the core language specification went into last call a year ago, just a few days before this conference, and uh, we did a second last call a few months ago. We got useful feedback from implementers. We improved the semantics of if and choose. If you came to the uh, workshop we did on the unconference day, you will have seen some examples of that. Uh, we removed a, a function that turned out to be solve the general serialize a map function, so we decided to skip that one. Um, we've uh, tightened up the meaning of URIs, which I think is an interesting and somewhat uh, risky thing to do, but it seems to be working out okay, at least in the test suite. We improved the semantics of viewport, clarified some details. It hasn't had a whole lot of further comment from uh, either implementers or people that we think are experimenting, so we're pretty happy with that. The standard step library is coming along well. I am not going to read that entire list to you. If you're familiar with 1.0, uh, you will see some old friends in there. If you're uh, looking carefully, you will see some new friends. Uh, we now have steps related to archives and steps related to some things that operate on non-XML documents, which is handy. Um, and we said we were going to do last call in February of 2020. It is, in fact, February of 2020, so should we go to last call? Yes. All right, let's do it. Let's go to last call. Let me find the browser window where I can go to last call. Uh, so I am going to push the create a pull request button, <laughs> and I'm going to create that pull request. And in order to update the other page, I have to create a pull request in the other repo, so we'll ignore that. So. Uh, if we go to the uh, XPROC page now and look at it, we will see that the core language specification is in last call and the standard step library is not. If one of my helpful editorial colleagues will approve those pull requests, then uh, we will... Yes, when the checks have completed, I've, all right, I've run this joke into the ground. Let's move on. Uh, the, we'll come back to that page later. Uh, there are additional steps not in the core step library, and in the interest of being done uh, in this millennium, we didn't make it in the last one, unfortunately, uh, we're not going to hold up uh, claiming to be finished for all of these optional step libraries, but uh, we have plans for dynamic execution for file and OS steps, which are coming along well, and a variety of other things. And of course, you are free to uh, propose new steps, ask us for things, get together in groups and invent some steps for the formats and transformations and work that you uh, want to do. Uh, in particular, we have uh, had some interest in uh, 
linked data, semantic web steps, but no one stepped up with the relevant domain expertise to help us with those, so you could do that. Uh, you are more than welcome. Are the implementations ready? Well, there are two, so that's good. Uh, Morgana Xproc from uh, Akim is, I believe, uh, going to go into public beta at the end of March. Did I get that right? End of February. Clock is ticking, end of February. Uh, my implementation uh, is coming along reasonably well, and it will go into last call. It will go into public beta. <laughs> um, Excuse me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, 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 Yes, yes, I'm sorry. I will, I will, from this point forward, speak slowly, but I don't have time to back up. I mean, you know, we're, we're, we're tight on time today. Um, one question that I've been asked a few times is, what is the interoperability story going to be here? And I'm pleased to say that Akim and I are planning to try and be API compatible. So you should be able to plug and play them in and out uh, in any environment you want. And, uh, and Therefore, you only have to write one plugin for Oxygen. You only have to write one plugin for the other thing you want. You only have to do, you know, one at a time. So we're hoping that that's uh, something everybody's happy about. You can check out the test suite. Uh, you can see how we're doing. There are about 1,700 or so tests in there, and uh, Akim has one failure. Uh, it's a minor failure. He's reporting the wrong error code. Um, one of the things that we did in 3.0 is we allow you in try catch to have multiple catch statements and catch on error codes. So we're trying to be more responsive about getting the right error codes. Um, my implementation um, isn't doing quite as well at the moment. Uh, that, those are my, re my results from uh, December when there were only 1,600 tests in the test suite. Uh, I ran it again today and couldn't get better than 74.82%, so I didn't update the slide. Um, but uh, it's coming along. Uh, my failures uh, are lack of implementation in some areas. There are now, I don't know, more than 100 tests for HTTP request, and I can do an HTTP request, a GET, with no authentication. Um, so I've got some work to do, but I'm optimistic that we'll, we'll get there soonish. Um, and that comes to the, to the crux of the matter, which is, are you ready? And uh, I think there's two uh, important things that I should cover in the course of trying to help you answer that question. Um, if you think about XPROC, uh, it doesn't exist in a vacuum. We don't just do XPROC. We all have uh, the need to interface with other services in the organizations we work in, with other services on the web, with other collaborators. And so um, in order to be really useful, XPROC 3, attempts to do two things. It attempts to uh, be more useful with non-XML formats, and it attempts to be easier to use. And I'm sort of going to walk through two sets of examples, including a live demo uh, of, of, my, of my implementation. So you should be really at least 74% confident. Um, and, and then I will, uh, I will take you through a little bit of uh, compare and contrast, where we'll look at uh, some work that uh, Akim did most of uh, converting a significant, or a real world anyway, pipeline, the one that uh, transforms DocBook from 1.0 to 3.0. And I'll show a side-by-side -side comparison of that, and we'll, we'll look at uh, the improvements. So uh, non-XML formats. Well, first, I want to have a little aside about non-XML formats. Um, once upon a time, there were XML APIs, and there were XML descriptions of APIs, and, and, uh, and all was good in the world, uh, except that XML was too hard, namespaces were confusing, lining up those begin and end tags is just much, much, much too much work. You can't expect a busy programmer to be able to do anything like well-formedness. So, if you're not going to do XML, there is an obvious solution, right? We all, we all know precisely what the next thing was. <coughs> S expressions, of course. No, you're not ready. Never mind. Uh, in fact, uh, what we now deal with mostly on, uh, on the web is, is JSON, uh, JSON uh, API descriptions and JSON payloads, and those are much better than XML because all you have to do is line up the curly braces and you get much richer data. Um, you just have to line up the curly braces, uh, and of course that never causes any problems at all. Um, there's no reason to think that uh, this is an issue. I should say that uh, if I load this up, and you probably won't be able to see the red underlining, but when I get to the bottom here, there's 
there is, in fact, an error. <laughs> and I know what you're thinking. I know exactly what you're thinking. Stop thinking that. Um, you're thinking that I'm cheating. I've, I've, I've made this thing into a great big blob, and no one would look at it like that, right? So I think that's fair. So here it is, nicely formatted. I'll page through it sort of slowly, and when you see the error, you shout out, OK? Don't, don't, uh, don't let me go too fast. Make sure you have a chance to sort of figure out where the error is. You've, I know where the error is, and you've missed it. Um, <laughs> Yes, I'm making fun of Jason, because it's fun. Um, no, uh, what, we, what we get now, even, even more interesting than, uh, than Jason, uh, especially for things like cloud formation from AWS, which is what that example was, is YAML. YAML replaces all the curly braces and quotation marks and things with significant white space and uh, indentations and hyphens, and we, we can be sure that won't ever go wrong. But YAML is interesting for this demo because it isn't something that you get out of the XPath data model. It's an alternate serialization of JSON, but from the perspective of XPath, it's just a binary document, there is, or a text document at least. And so with my little uh, tirade about formats out of the way, I'm going to walk you through a little example and, and demonstrate a pipeline that does something useful, and I've made it short because I've only got about 10 more minutes. I'm going to load a uh, description of a web service that's in YAML. I'm going to convert that into JSON. I'm going to call that web service. And I'm going to produce the, print the output as CSV. And I'm going to do it live. So here is, our, here is our first pipeline. And it has a p colon load, which is going to go off and load the YAML service description. Ta-da! So uh, there you go. That, that, it, it succeeded in loading that file. My implementation, if you attempt to, to, to output a binary, just dumps the bits out. Uh, Emacs is actually putting the colons in front. A whole other presentation. Um, so that's interesting. What are you going to do with the YAML? Well, we know that it's an alternate serialization of JSON. One of the steps we added in, uh, in XPROC 3 as sort of a can opener is called cast content type. And this is how you can say, you've got this thing in this content type. Give it back to me in this other content type. And so you can go from JSON to XML. You can go between different flavors of XML. It, isn't, it, it doesn't do anything terribly sophisticated. This is not a, you can't go from, uh, from image ping to image SVG, for example. And Akim and I and the other editors and some of the other folks uh, who come to our meetings are concerned about how much of a Swiss Army knife we're turning this into. But for the purpose of this demonstration, because implementations are allowed to extend what they can do, I decided that casting uh, YAML to JSON was perfectly reasonable. Oops, I typed the wrong key. No, it's got to be in there. So this time, what it's going to do is it's going to go and get that uh, service description in YAML and pass it through cast content type. And now we get JSON, so that's good. Uh, now I'm going to, I've got that JSON context, and uh, I'm going to use the HTTP request step to get the crew list service. And so uh, in, in, as an homage to the uh, fabulous tutorial that Akim did uh, uh, at Markup UK, where he had this complicated recursive pipeline that got Star Wars data from the Star Wars database, uh, I pretended I had a little Star Trek database. So uh, you've seen loading YAML and converting it into JSON and using that JSON as a first class uh, data type in XPROC to compose an HTTP request service and, uh, and make a request. Um, the next thing I said was that I would produce a CSV from it. Interesting uh, aside here, what do you do for, for a CSV? I considered um, implementing JSON to CSV and cast content type, and then I imagined the look that Akim would give me when I told, me, told him that and decided not to. Um, the, the other possibility is to have a new step. I could have an extension step. Uh, I, in the end, I decided to hack it with XSLT. Uh, it's complicated because you need to consider what you were going to do if the hunk of JSON you got wasn't an array of objects. If, you, if I go back to the previous slide, you'll see that's a nice, convenient array of objects. 
Uh, so if I run this one, We could not call it a hack if it was in the spec, that's true, but trust me, this style sheet is a hack. <laughs> um, so there we go. There's the CSV output of uh, the JSON data that came from the web service that was described in YAML and loaded in a pipeline. Um, I'm not sure I'm going to go into any detail about it, but the style sheet that does that was new to me. I haven't written very many XSLT3 style sheets. And I had a JSON object, a JSON uh, map that I wanted to be processed by XSLT. And so I had to work out uh, various ways to do that. And I ended up using, actually, if we go back, uh, new in, new in, uh, in XPROC3 is the ability to set the global context item for, and I probably should have said this is a X, XSLT 3.0 step, but. Um, I thought I would leave the style sheet in the, uh, in the presentation, which I will eventually put up on the web, uh, just because it was marginally interesting to me to pass it through and, and walk over it in uh, XSLT and produce CSV, crudely produce CSV, I should say. Right, so that was my attempt to demonstrate and actually do a little demo of some of the things you can do for non-XML data types. <coughs> For the last little part before I open it up to questions, I'm going to compare and contrast some pipelines. Um, is there anybody here who's never tried to write an XPROC 1.0 pipeline? Yeah, a fair number of you. Okay, fair enough. So um, I will attempt to explain what these th things are doing. Shorter is better. If nothing else comes across, shorter is better. So um, the XPROC 1.0 specification has a really complicated way of dealing with parameters, and it's a different kind of input port, and it's pseudo-magic, and it's complicated and awful, and it no longer exists. Uh, we now have maps, and so if you want to pass parameters to steps, to pipelines, to things like XSLT, you construct a map. Um, there's one tiny little way in which that's not quite as nice, but it's so much nicer in every other way that... Um, it's not worth fussing about. Output and serialization. So in, uh, in XPROC 1.0, you had to uh, declare the, out the output had to declare the port, and you had to include a p colon pipe to say what step you wanted to get that output from. Uh, in this particular case, uh, I probably could have left it out, but no, actually, you can't in this case because it's a secondary output port. You do actually have to do that. And separately, if you want to specify serialization for that port, you have to have a serialization element that does that. Uh, in XPROC 3, we've simplified this considerably. Uh, the serialization properties are now a map on the output rather than uh, a separate element. And we have a shortcut syntax that I won't attempt to go into detail on, which allows you to specify that, um, that pipe directly on the output statement, so you don't need that nested element. Um, I should also say that uh, not demonstrated in, this, uh, in these uh, examples, uh, it's now possible for the output parameters to be uh, sensitive to the kind of output that the pipeline actually produced. So if you run a style sheet and sometimes it produces text CSV and sometimes it produces XML and sometimes produces HTML, you can have the pipeline serialize it correctly, which was not straightforward in 1.0. Uh, so in 1.0, in this particular pipeline, there were some things that I wanted to do. I wanted to be able to change the base URI. I wanted to be able to output some messages, so I had to declare some extension steps. And uh, the way you do that in 3.0 is you don't. Uh, those functions are now built into the language, so you don't need an extension for that. Um, conditional processing, so one of the things that this pipeline does is if you've given it a schema, it validates your input against that schema, and if you haven't given it a schema, it doesn't. So uh, it has to test if there's a schema, and if there isn't, that is to say if the schema option is empty, it just does the identity transform, and otherwise it does this much more complicated thing, and this choose has to have two branches. The two branches have to have the same output ports. These were just constraints in the 1.0 design that we felt we had to do at the time, and we no longer feel we have to do. The, uh, the 3.0 way is much, much, much nicer. We now have an if element, which has the semantic of acting like the identity transform if the conditional is false. 
And so you can just do that, which is much nicer. Um, if you want to uh, pass parameters into a step, if you want to pass arbitrary runtime parameters into a uh, XSLT step, for example, in 1.0, you had to do this with the funny uh, parameter input port, and you had to combine them together uh, in this sort of uh, semi-magic syntax that you had to know about. In 3.0, um, it's just a map. So you might have to cast your input parameters into JSON, but then you can just merge them with whatever parameters you wanted and pass them in. I've stuck them in a variable there because of a cut and paste error, I think. But much, much simpler. Uh, if you want to combine the parameters together, you've got sort of the same problem with having to use the parameter input ports, et cetera. Uh, if you are doing it in 3.0, much simpler, just pass in the combined parameters as the parameters from there. We're doing a time. I'm doing, our, oh, I'm doing very long time because I'm done. Uh, so that's Xproc 3.0, and uh, I have left uh, nine minutes for questions, I guess, which doesn't seem too, too bad. Any questions? Thank you, Norm. We have plenty of time for questions, so any question over there? So, Garrett? Anyone else? Sorry, Garrett, before you, oh, okay. before you ask your question, it worked. We're now in last call. <laughs> <laughs> I almost forgot that part. Is, is that true? Because last time I checked, uh, the, the link didn't work, so I, I got a 404. But maybe. Well, yeah, that's because I put 2020-15 in the link instead of 202 because, you know. And the other thing is that I didn't uh, see a, um, a branch for, for this in the public repo. Maybe it's only in locally private. in your copy. No, no, the pull request put it in. Uh, yes, I, OK. So, okay. so, so yeah. let's wait another couple of minutes, and then it will probably be live. Ordinarily, I wouldn't announce something before I'd actually checked that it worked. But given that I wanted to do the joke about doing it on stage, I didn't have that luxury. So my bad, I got burned for it. It'll be fixed soon. Abel, yes. you want to say something? Uh, yeah, you. I have a question you, about um, those parameter things that you showed earlier. You said in Xproc 1, you do it this way, and it was very complex. And Xproc 3, it's, uh, you don't do it that way anymore, and now you have maps, Correct. right? But my question was, um, the, the old way doesn't work at all anymore? I mean, is it compatible or...? No. There's no we, we made no attempt to... I mean, the, 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 the language spec has an appendix that lists the backwards incompatible things, but we gave up trying to, to make it backwards compatible. This is, it is, we're, we hope to have a style sheet which will bring your 1.0 pipelines into the 3.0 world, but you're going, to have to, you're going to have to rewrite some parts of it. Okay, thank you. Maybe we have time for one more question. Over there. Uh, hey, Norm. Uh, repeating my question from yesterday that I addressed to Rachel, uh, where would a total beginner in XProp go? Um, Eric's, bo Eric's book in about <laughs> a, 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 in, a, in a couple of weeks or a month, end of, end of, that's what's coming out the end of March. Before the end of March. Eric's book before the end of March is your best bet. Um, the specs, we hope, are readable. Lots of people in this audience would be comfortable reading the specs. We've tried to make them clear and complete, et cetera, but if you're looking for a gentler introduction with more examples, Eric's book is your best bet. There's information about it on the table. There's information about the book on the table outside. And I, is there still a card for getting a, yeah, there's still a card for getting a, a pre-order discount from the publisher. And Kanava. And Kanava stickers, yes, indeed. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. Yep. Thank you. So thank you very much, You're very welcome.